Hey everyone, this is Eric Steinberg and Mustafa Syed. Welcome to the MRADS video series. Let's go. <laughs> Today's case is a 46 year old fat bastard with complaint of shortness of breath. He's huffing, puffing, and he can barely complete a sentence. Look at his vitals. He needs to be tubed, right? Now look at his neck. Maybe we can hold off on that tube for a minute. So what's our differential diagnosis for acute shortness of breath in the emergency department? In the anaphylactic patient, usually there's an instigating factor, like penicillin, food, or a bee sting. The patients may be striderous, wheezing, or have changes in their voice. Manage the airway, give roids, block the histamine receptors, and keep pushing epi. Remember, there is no max. We see plenty of anxiety attacks in our practice, but make sure to rule out the badness first. A nice hug and simple reassurance should help. Asthma and COPD patients usually have a known history or they smell like an ashtray. For the not too sick, give nebs, steroids, and a Z-pack. Sicker asthmatics benefit from mag and epi. CHF patients present with rails, edema, and JVD. The chest x-ray can help us immediately and the BMP can help you later if you're still not sure. This treatment focuses on preload and afterload reduction. Always consider severe pneumonia in the patient who is short of breath. For details, see our pneumonia lecture. Pneumothorax occurs in trauma patients and tall patients and smokers. This is one of the times where using your stethoscope may actually be useful. If unstable, do a needle or finger thoracostomy before placing that chest tube. Finally, PE is always high in our differential of shortness of breath and risk factors such as OCP use, smoking, history of DVT, previous surgeries, history of cancer and immobilization are all should be taken into account. The PER criteria, which will be discussed in a later episode, helps us risk stratify these patients. Give heparin for the stable ones and lytics for the unstable ones. Now let's go on to the image. And his x-ray looks like this. If I had to say, I would call it bilateral badness. <laughs> so I'll just describe this x-ray as bilateral hazy opacities that are more central. And uh, by the end of this lecture, we'll be able to break down each component and you'll know exactly what's going on pathologically and radiographically. And radiographically. <laughs> so the radiographic pearls for CHF are pretty simple. There's cardiomegaly, which is, is the heart big or is it not big? There's vascular enlargement, and uh, I'll touch on that in a future slide. And then there's vascular pedicle size, which basically refers to the borders of the superior vena cava. There's interstitial edema, and uh, these have the buzzwords that I'm sure you've all heard of curly lines and peribronchial thickening. And then there's alveolar edema, which is the classic bat wing appearance, and then the presence of effusions. Now keep in mind, your CHF patient may have all or maybe even none of these findings on their chest x-ray. Alright, so big heart. You hear this term thrown out a lot, you know, cardiomegaly, no cardiomegaly. So the first thing to consider is what kind of view did you get? Did you get an AP view or a PA view? Because the AP views are not great for assessing heart size. There's a lot of technique uh, that changes the heart size. And usually on AP view, the heart is magnified. So that makes our assessment incorrect. The best thing to do is to look at the prior x-rays and see if the heart has changed significantly in comparison to those. The PA view is your ideal view. And ideally what you want is a good inspiration, and then you want to measure the heart at its widest diameter, and then you want to compare it to the diameter of the thorax. And the simple rule is anything greater than 50% is considered cardiomegaly. The specificity for this is pretty high, it's 70 to 80%, but as you can see, it's not very sensitive. The sensitivity is 50%, that's about as good as throwing up a coin. The pitfalls for this are quite a few. There's poor inspiration. You and I, if we take a poorly inspired x-ray, we can look like we have cardiomegaly. There's a large pericardial effusion, which will give you the false appearance of cardiomegaly. Large fat pads, which are just normal, benign anatomical variants, can give you the appearance of cardiomegaly. And florid COPD can make a big heart look small because the lungs are so hyperinflated. So cardiomegaly. These aren't real measurements. These are just relative for, to show you exactly how we do it. So this is a PA view. And uh, even just by eyeballing this, you can tell that the heart looks big. So what you do, as you can see with the blue arrows, you measure the heart size at the widest diameter. Then you measure the thorax from the dome of the diaphragm across. And the ratio of those should be greater than 50%. In this case, it is, and that means it's cardiomegaly. So as fluid is backing up into our system with CHF, it starts at the heart, then it goes back into the pulmonary vasculature. 
So we're done with cardiomegaly. Let's move on to the vascular components we see on the CHF x-ray. Okay, vascular findings. You hear this classic term called cephalization of the vessels. And the other thing, which you probably haven't heard of as often, is the vascular pedicle. And if the vascular pedicle is greater than 80 millimeters, it's considered abnormal. But this is, this is kind of an arbitrary number. So what cephalization means is that it's the equalization of the size of blood vessels. So when someone is sitting up and they take a good x-ray, PA, with good inspiration, normally gravity pulls most of the blood volume downwards. So the vessels towards the lower lung are usually bigger than the vessels of the upper lung. When you have the backup of fluid from the heart, what happens is that the lower lung vessels, they stay the same, and as the fluid backs up, the upper lung vessels start to engorge as well. And now you have equalization of the calibers of both vessels. That's called cephalization. So the vascular pedicle, the reason it's important is that the superior vena cava, as you can see, makes up the left border of your vascular pedicle. And the logical thing is that when you have fluid backed up, the superior vena cava is going to be larger in size because there's a lot of fluid there. And what this causes is an enlargement of the diameter of the vascular pedicle. So you measure from the perceived border of the superior vena cava all the way to the arch of the aorta across. This number is not, there's not a lot of studies proving that this number is right or that number is right. The best way to assess vascular pedicle is by looking at the old x-rays and seeing if it's markedly widened or if it's not. So here we have a pre-CHF x-ray and a post-CHF x-ray. And what I want to draw your attention to is the vascular pedicle here. And if you compare it to this one, you don't even have to measure it. You can see that it's markedly widened. Now, hopefully this person is positioned correctly. They're sitting up. So now you can assume that there's engorgement of the SVC, and this is why the pedicle is widened. Now, if you look at the vessels on this particular x-ray, you can see that the lower vessels are much more prominent or distinct than the upper ones. The upper ones are very thin lines. If you look at the one with CHF, you can see that the lower vessels have increased in size, but now you can look at the arrows and you can see that the upper vessels have all also increased in size, and they're actually almost the same size as the lower ones. So now the fluid's backed up into our heart, it's backed up into our vasculature, and it's going to keep on backing up, and now it's going to go into our bronchioles. So let's go over some of the things we see now. Interstitial edema. So what is the interstitium? The interstitium is basically the tissue that is surrounding the alveoli. So it's the non-air-filled tissue. What happens is as the increased arterial pressure builds up, the vessels engorge, and you'll see something that's basically blurring the vessels. Normally you see nice sharp vessels. The edema causes blurring, and now your vessels look hazy on the x-ray. As this backs up, the fluid rolls into the fissure, and because of that, you get prominent fissure lines. Normally, the way we describe it is that the fissure lines are pencil thin, but when fluid builds up in it, you'll see them widen, and you'll, you'll definitely see them become more opaque. As fluid continues to build up, it builds up in the interstitium, and this gives you the curly lines. So there's two kinds of curly lines. There's curly B and curly A. For radiographic purposes, there's difference. In clinical terms, it really doesn't matter. As long as you see curly lines, you know there's fluid backed up. So curly B lines, they're interlobular septa, and you can see that we've highlighted the B in interlobular to kind of remind you that it's curly B. Interlobular septal lines happen at the periphery. They're very short and they're horizontal and they're always kind, they're always intersecting the bone. That's how you know it's a curly B line. Curly A lines are more central. So you'll see a long oblique line coming across from the hilum. So it's coming originating from the hilum and then going across the lung. And it usually ends about midway. And I'll point them out on the x-ray that's coming up. So here we have a really good example of curly B lines. This is what we talked about. The components of the lung are separated by septa. You know, you have a package of alveoli, and they're set up in interstitium, and then you have a bunch of those, and they're kind of bound, they're bordered by septa. So here you see these opaque lines all over. I don't have to point all of them out to you, but where these arrows are, these are the septa full of fluid because of the backup of, they're 90 degrees of the pleura, they're horizontal, and they're all peripheral. These are your curly B lines. This x-ray, again, it shows you a bunch of curly B lines, but it's also showing you curly A lines. If you look here, this is a long oblique line coming across from the hilum, and it ends about midway. It's oblique, um, so, I mean some of them can be horizontal, but usually they're oblique, like this one, this one, and this one. This is the same thing. This is just fluid building up in the interstitium of the vasculature. And the vasculature is obviously more prominent centrally because that's how the lung branches out. So these are curly A lines, these, hor these obliquely oriented central opaque lines. All right, so here's a good example of a CHF x-ray with a lot of findings. What you can see that really stands out on the patient's right side is fluid in the minor fissure. It's bulging, it's a huge 
white line that shouldn't be there. So I already know that's badness. Also, we can see curly A lines sticking out, like we said, obliquely, ending midway, and that's another sign. The other thing that you hear a lot in radiology reports, and I'm sure you've, you've definitely come across this term, is bronchial thickening and peribronchial cuffing. This part of the interstitial edema phase, and it's just a fancy word for backup of fluid congesting the capillaries in the tissues lining the bronchi. Remember, your bronchi also have their own blood supply, so they also have tissue lining them. What happens is, as the pressure in the arteries backs up, the tissues surrounding the bronchi engorge, and this looks like bronchial thickening secondary to edematous tissues. As you have increased buildup of edema around the interstitium of the bronchi, you'll get some localized atelectasis in the area. And when you see this head-on, so not the lengthwise, but if you cut the bronchus and you look at the bronchus, this is what looks like cuffing, and I'll show you an example of it. So here's a good example of peribronchial cuffing. This is, this is you looking at a bronchus along its length. So you know this is a bronchus because you can see that it's more lucent than the surrounding tissue. That means it's air-filled. And where this big white arrowhead is pointing, this is thickening of the bronchial lining. Normally, if you look at an x-ray, you can see bronchi, but their borders are, again, very thin. When they become engorged with fluid and edematous, you start seeing this opacity along the bronchus running with it. This is the peribronchial cuffing, and this is lengthwise. If you look here, you can see the bronchus on end. It looks like a donut, and then around it, you'll see some white cuffing. This is, this is also peribronchial cuffing. You're just looking at it end on. So now the fluid's through the vessels, through the interstitium, and now it's flooding the alveoli. There's really no place left for the fluid to go. So the last finding we see at the latest stage of CHF is alveolar edema, which is characterized by the bat wing appearance and pleural effusions. So this is alveolar edema. The most exciting part of this lecture. So the heart is full of fluid, that's engorged, the vessels are engorged, and now the fluid is spilling over into the interstitium. So far, we know what's going on. And now there's really no other place for it to go except the alveoli. That's the only remaining space in the lung that hasn't filled. So alveolar edema is going to be predominantly lower lung, sparing the periphery, and this gives you the batwing appearance. The reason it's predominantly lower lung is obviously because it's gravity dependent. So whatever way the patient is sitting or lying for a while, that's where the fluid is going to collect. This is why you can also get asymmetric alveolar edema. If you have someone who's lying on their right side for a couple of hours, you'll only have right-sided edema and right-sided effusion. Man, this looks terrible. And that it is. The key point here is that you have complete opacification. A lot of the signs we talked about before aren't really apparent. I mean, a few things you can see. You can see some of the vessels up here that are engorged. And then what you kind of see is just white out of the lower lungs and the mid lungs. That's more central than peripheral. And this is because the alveoli are now filling up. And as they fill up with fluid, they collapse, they opacify, and you get this hazy opacity, and it starts centrally because that's where the pressure is going to be, and then it builds out peripherally. Eventually, if you have bad enough CHF, the whole lung can white out. So this is your classic bat wing appearance. This is another really good example of bat wing appearance. Again, you can see the central dominance of alveolar filling, and the, you can see that the vessels, you can see some of the vessels out here in gorge, but mostly this is a really good example of battling edema. The alveolar are filled up, they've undergone atelectasis, and they're starting to opacify. Effusions are the last part. Lymphatic compromise leads to the inability to clear fluid. So your fluid keeps accumulating, and your lymphatic drainage can't keep up. And as a result, you get buildup of the fluid in the pleural space. This you know already, and this is called a pleural effusion. So let's talk a little bit about views. Everyone likes to get a PA or an AP view to look for the fluid, but really the lateral view is most, more sensitive. The lateral view can show you fluid at a minimum of 75 cc's, whereas an erect PA view shows it to you when it's 200 to 250 cc's. An AP view can show you the same thing as a PA view if they're positioned well. If the patient is not positioned well, then you might not get the classic appearance of effusions. And patients who are really sick or in pediatric patients who might not sit still for a lateral, a decubitus view helps, and we'll show you examples of all of this. So what are some things that we can say in radiology terms? The cool terms. Blunting of the costophrenic angles, Ooh. meniscus formation, Menisci. and the lungs are pushed centrally. Who doesn't love a push lung? So this is a pretty classic example of effusions, and this is a PA view. So you know this person is sitting up, this gravity-dependent layering of the fluid. And these are some of the things we talked about. One. We lose the hemidiaphragms, they're silhouetted because there's fluid layering them. Two, there's no costophrenic angles. Remember, normal x-rays have a nice, sharp costophrenic angle on each side. You don't see that here. Three, 
everything looks a little bit hazy. Nothing is defined on this side. And the other thing you should look at is that if you look laterally, you see the white line curving upwards, as opposed to downwards, which is, where, which is how you would see the diaphragm go. This curving is the meniscus of the pleural effusion. So now right away you know you at least have fluid in the costophrenic angles. On an AP view, this gets a little bit tricky because people hold all sorts of positions. They might be at a 45 degree angle. You can have someone lying down and call it an AP view. So this puts us at a disadvantage. But it doesn't mean we can't assess for effusions. You just have to be more careful. On this AP view, everything looks kind of hazy on both sides, right? But it doesn't look like the alveoli are opacified. It doesn't look like that central batwing appearance we saw earlier. This is because when a person lies down, the fluid starts shifting from the bottom and just kind of layering across. Think of it as a glass of spilled water. It just layers across the surface. And as a result, it gives this hazy appearance to both sides of the lung. It might not necessarily silhouette the diaphragms, but what you'll see if you zoom in and look very carefully is that you'll see a space without any lung markings, and then you'll see a border of the lung. And this tells you that there's a fluoral effusion pushing the lung away from the sides of the rib cage. This is difficult to spot. You really have to zoom in and take a look and be, be thorough when you're looking for it. But as soon as you see this haziness, something should clue you off in terms of effusions or something going on in the lung. Again, the lateral foam is the money shot for pleural effusion. Again, it only takes 75 cc's of fluid to be able to see something. And here on the left, it looks pretty obvious when we're comparing it to a normal. But look at the blunting of the costophrenic angle right there, and the meniscus sign. It's curved upward instead of down. Very simple. Also, the diaphragms are silhouetted out. So let's say we have a really sick kid, and the only film we can get is a lateral D-cube. Is it helpful? Absolutely, it's very helpful. So what you do is you turn the kid to the side, or the really sick patient, whoever it is, you turn, you have them lie on the side that you suspect the effusion. And like we talked about before, the fluid will layer out across the chest, it'll be on the dependent side. And here, you can see this person, you'll have to take my word for it, I didn't trick you by rotating the image, but this person shows a lot of pleural fluid, and it's layering across his side. And this is dependent layering. And the, I know a lot of people don't get the decubitus view, but it's very helpful. And you can see, you can use it for pneumothorax as well. So like everything in radiology, you have to know your study's pitfalls to know that you're diagnosing it accurately. If you have someone with surgery, or maybe they're had asbestos issues, or they're just a chronic smoker, they'll have a lot of scarring in the pleura. The scarring in the pleura will, might not give you the classic appearance of effusions. Sometimes we get something like loculated effusions. And this is basically fluid accumulating between scarred areas of the pleura, and it's trapped there. It doesn't go anywhere. So now you'll get really funny looking effusions. So just keep an eye out for that. If you have lung disease, where either they have a lot of emphysema or COPD, and that area doesn't have a lot of architecture, you might see areas that look very clear, even though the rest of the lung is very hazy. Don't let that throw you off. Look at the big picture. False cephalization is an important point. If you and I lie down and we take an x-ray, it'll look like all of our vessels are cephalized, because we're, the entire lung is now evenly gravity dependent. So this is why cephalization, a lot of radiologists, they say that you don't see it very frequently. And a lot of times it's position dependent, so it becomes difficult to call. So make sure the positioning is right, then decide if it's cephalization. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Unfortunately, sometimes in the ED, we actually have to talk to the patient to kind of figure out what's going on. Radiologists never talk to patients. Oh, oh yeah. <sighs> that explains a lot. Anyway, so... Not all pulmonary edema is cardiogenic. There are tons and tons of causes of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, from infectious, including sepsis, hantavirus, toxic, like opiates, aspirin, cocaine, amiodarone, environmental, like high-altitude pulmonary edema, and many other things, such as trauma, DIC, pulmonary embolism, neurogenic reperfusion, and re-expansion pulmonary edema. So always keep that in mind. And Eric makes a very good point. History is really important. A lot of times when I'm reading a film, I don't have the history, and I don't know who gave the history. Is it an intern? Is it a medical student? Is it the attending? So it becomes important because the appearance of CHF, florid CHF, can look like a lot of other things. It can absolutely look like pneumonia. It can absolutely look like DIC. It can definitely look like ARDS. So history is very important. Always correlate your films with the history. I actually just click the button that says chest pain. So now we know how to diagnose acute pulmonary edema. But how do we treat it? It's as easy as LMNOP, AB. And for those of you who actually like to think, we have different goals. Preload reduction, afterload reduction, ionotropic support, and ventilatory support. So the L stands for Lasix. It reduces preload by inhibiting salt reabsorption in the loop of Henle, and it promotes urine excretion. 
Remember in these patients, renal perfusion can be significantly diminished, and there can be a significant delayed effect. In some studies, up to two hours for the Lasix to work. So maybe it's not really too great in the acute phase, right when they're rolling into your recess room. Also keep in mind that some evidence states that up to 40% of these patients are either euvolemic or hypovolemic. So just because their lungs are full of fluid doesn't mean that their tank is full. So maybe diuresing these patients isn't always the best. Morphine makes people feel happy inside. Theoretically, it's supposed to reduce your preload. There's not too much evidence to support that, but what it definitely does is take away the anxiety. So people like to give a little bit. Nitro is by far the most important pharmacological agent you can use. It's fast, it's effective, and it has a very short half-life. Those are three great things. Use very high doses as long as the blood pressure tolerates it. And always be weary of the patients who are on Viagra because you can drop their patient their pressure very fast. Viagra. Oxygen's obvious. The P stands for pressors, especially in that scary uh, pulmonary edema patient with low blood pressure, which we don't see too often, but you can see it in the aortic um, stenosis patient or someone who had an MI and terrible pump failure. In a lot of cases, dobutamine is a choice because of its ionotropic effect. But remember, that can also reduce your preload and your afterload and cause a decrease in your blood pressure. So if that's the case, you want to switch to norepi. Now remember, once you get that pressure up with the presser, it's okay to add nitroglycerin on. You want that preload reduction and you want your pump to work. So use both at the same time. Remember, the catecholamines are surging in these patients most of the time. And your heart is pumping up against a brick. So give your heart a break. Give them an ACE inhibitor, reduce the afterload. It'll help them out a lot. Finally, BiPAP has revolutionized the way we treat acute pulmonary edema. Not only does it decrease the work of breathing, but it also increases intrathoracic pressure, further decreasing the preload. It works in both ways to really help you save your patients. It's revolutionized treatment of acute pulmonary edema so much that now a lot of people are saying that if you have to intubate these patients, it's a failure. I always intubate my patients. <laughs> wow, we uh, did a great job on this guy. He looks skinny. Too bad me neck looks like a vagina. So remember that the most important thing, instead of just memorizing facts, is to understand the pathophysiology of the disease. As pressure backs up, as it increases, we go from the heart to the vasculature to the bronchi to the alveoli, then I guess out on the floor. Yep. And that's the pleural effusions. Just remember, CHF has stages. Not everyone comes in with bat wing edema, and not everyone will have cephalization. People manifest differently. If you keep the big picture in mind and you have your clinical history, you can use the imaging in conjunction and arrive at your diagnosis. And as always, keep a broad differential for shortness of breath. And with anything, any patient that rolls in, always take a great history because you'll be surprised at what you'll find sometimes. And also remember, just because you have CHF doesn't mean you can't have something else. When, when alveoli collapse, atelectasis is a great nidus for pneumonia. So when we say a superimposed pneumonia cannot be excluded, it's true. The patient, especially in older people with a lot of comorbidities, they can develop a pneumonia. So always keep an eye. Don't be satisfied with just one diagnosis. Make sure you give your patient the due diligence they deserve. And finally, when it's very stressful and you just want a quick way to remember how to treat these patients, LMNOP, AB. When you want to sound smart, remember the four goals. Preload reduction after load reduction, ionotropic support, and ventilatory support. Even a radiologist could remember that. Ayo! Well, once again, we hope you learned something, and I hope our jokes weren't too bad. Just remember, CHF is a very commonly encountered problem in all aspects of medicine, not just the ED. So hopefully you can use some of the tips we gave and combine the clinical history and correct interpretation of the imaging. For the next lecture, Eric ate too much Chinese food and now has stomach pain. Could it be an SBO is the question. Guess not, I farted. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here?